this silence when everyone is on the screen together, I, it's, I find it so weird. So I'm going to fill the space now and just actually start talking. Um, hi, hi, everybody. Um, and welcome to the first University of Lethbridge Women Scholars Speaker Series event of the year 2023. My name is Christine Alexander. I'm a member of the History Department here at the University of Lethbridge. And along with my colleague, Dr. Suzanne Lennon, I'm one of the co-chairs of this year's Women's Scholar Speaker Series, which is supported by the Office of the University President. So in addition to acknowledging the funding provided by the President's Office, I also want to thank Jenny Osin, Hannah Fanton, Martha Matherin Moe, and Nando Ortega Arango for all of their work for making sure that things worked as smoothly as possible behind the scenes for getting us here, in other words. I recognize that some of you may be signing in from elsewhere. Uh, I am currently actually in Toronto. Um, and so at, because this is a University of Lethbridge event, however, um, I need to begin with the university's official land acknowledgement. The University of Lethbridge's Blackfoot name is Iniskim, which means sacred buffalo stone. The University of Lethbridge acknowledges and deeply appreciates the six decades of Tappi people's connections to their traditional territory. We, as people living and benefiting from Blackfoot Confederacy traditional territory, honor the traditions of people who have cared for this land since time immemorial. We recognize the diverse population of Indigenous peoples who attend the University of, Leth of Lethbridge and their contributions to shaping and strengthening the university community in the past, in the present, and in the future. At the same time, however, expressing such gratitude and thinking about the territory that each of us is currently on and how we might be in good relation with our human and non-human relatives, this also needs to include acknowledging how the actual practices of caretaking and stewardship are often unable to take place to their full extent under settler occupation and in places where land has been overlaid with private property. And of course, Western knowledge production and universities themselves are complicit in this. These are big questions and they're related closely to the issues that we are exploring in this year's Women Scholar Speaker Series, which is entitled The University and Its Worlds. What is a university anyway? Whose interests does the institution serve and which communities and life ways does it exclude or harm? Throughout the 2022-2023 academic year, our invited speakers and audience members are exploring these issues together through a number of virtual events. In the midst of ongoing funding cuts, precarity, labor struggle, public health crises, settler colonialism, racist violence, sexual violence, and last but certainly not least, uh, neoliberal extractivism, we hope to offer an opportunity to think deeply together about what is, and about what could be. So I'm going to turn things over now to my excellent co-chair, Dr. Suzanne Lennon. Thanks, Christine. Um, so just a quick reminder that the webinar this afternoon is being recorded. Um, and that will, we will, as usual, have a Q&A period following um, Dr. Jennifer Doyle's uh, talk. Um, so if you have any questions or comments um, that you'd like us to address, please enter these in the Q&A um, function, which you'll find at the bottom of your screen. Um, so it is my uh, real pleasure and delight uh, to introduce our speaker this afternoon, Dr. Jennifer Doyle, who is Professor of English at UC Riverside, where she uh, teaches art-centered courses in gender studies and queer theory and American literature and visual culture. Um, Dr. Doyle is the author of several books, including Sex Objects, Art and the Dialectics of Desire, Campus Sex, Campus Security, Hold It Against Me, Difficulty and Emotion in Contemporary Art, um, and she is co-editor of Pop Out Queer Warhol. She has guest curated Now Bustamante's Sol Soldera, Soldera, oh, I had, I've practiced this, Soldera, Soldadera, excuse me, for the Vincent Price Art Museum, um, working closely with the artist in developing this project. 
She has been a guest curator of several art exhibitions um, and is an active member of Human Resources Los Angeles curatorial team. Jennifer Doyle was the 2013-2014 Distinguished Fulbright, Fulbright Professor at the University of Arts London and is a recipient of an Arts Writers Grant. Um, today, Dr. Doyle is going to be speaking about um, and alongside the uh, work in her book, Campus Sex, Campus Security, and also its forthcoming companion, Shadow of My Shadow, and more generally about her work around harassment and its ecologies. So a big welcome to you, Dr. Doyle. Thank you. Um, sorry, I've got a little notice on my thing, so I think I just hit that. Okay, sorry. Um, I, you know, several years into the pandemic, I'm still getting used to the uh, Zoom uh, format. And um, I am uh, sad I'm not with you in person, but I am really glad to be here uh, in conversation with this community. And I'm grateful for this invitation to uh, revisit a book that I published in 2015. I'm going to hold it up in front of the camera now. <laughs> um, Campus, Sex, Cam Campus Sex, Campus Security, which is um, uh, was published by Semiotext in their series. Um, it's called um, Intervention. And uh, these are um, kind of polemics in a sense. I mean, I, 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 maybe that's too strong a word because I think it would be hard to identify a single argument um, in the book. Um, but um, um, I wrote the book uh, as a kind of sermon and I wrote it in a bit of a fever uh, as I was working through the wake of an, uh, an experience in which I was stalked by a graduate student of mine, somebody I'd worked with quite closely and who was suffering from um, a, you know, a, a huge crisis uh, um, and um, uh, which led to the end of her graduate studies. And uh, the case uh, against her uh, was filed by me. Um, I had to, I was asked uh, when I when she was stalking me, I had to uh, I would turn to the university for help. Um, I didn't quite know what to do, and I was directed to um, what's called in the United States a Title IX office, which is the office that receives uh, complaints about sexual violence and sexual harassment or gender-based forms of discrimination that involve students. Um, and uh, uh, you know, many schools now uh, in Canada and and, and, and employment um, and businesses will, I mean, uh, corporations will have some kind of office that receives complaints. Um, and so I'm sure that you have your own um, processes, right? So, but in essence, I was asked to engage in an administrative process, which allowed the um, st you know staff to basically organize a response to the situation and to the crisis. Um, and uh, what happened was uh, really harmful to me and also to the person who was stalking me. Um, and I, it was a lot. <laughs> and, um, uh, and the way that the institution handled it actually made me uh, much more vulnerable to harassment and stalking by this person. Um, it amplified the stalking dynamic, um, and which is a very aggravated form of harassment. Um, and that's actually something that's very harmful to the person who is vulnerable to the impulses to stalk and harass. And um, so I was kind of watching that unfold and all this happened in 2009 and 2010. And in the University of California, uh, uh, where I work, I work in one of our uh, many campuses across the state of California, the whole system was seized by um, uh, really the after effects of the Occupy movement. Um, and uh, so in the wake of the 2008 financial crash, which had a huge impact on our universities, uh, students were organizing to protest um, <clears throat> austerity measures that were being taken um, and that were really starving our campuses of resources. And then those demonstrations and protests were being violently policed, especially at um, uh, UC Berkeley, um, and um, but also on my campus, which is sort of the opposite of Berkeley. Berkeley is a very high profile uh, elite um, campus. Um, and uh, UC Riverside is uh, a lot of our students are first generation. We're very poorly resourced. And the things that happen at UC Riverside are rarely newsworthy, even when they're very dramatic. And so um, our students you know, were beaten in demonstrations. Uh, Longtime instructional faculty were arrested and jailed. 
um, and this was kind of flying kind of below the radar um, in terms of news media coverage, um, which tended to focus on other campuses. Um, anyway, I just, it, the whole situation had me thinking, right? Because in, in this one moment, I was uh, vulnerable to uh, a very real crisis, a uh, crisis um, that was also pushing me towards engaging the, um, uh, sorry, I just lost an earring. Um, I'm just gonna take the other one off just to, for cement, symmetry's sake. Um, uh, I was uh, yeah, new to the experience of being a, a victim in this way. Um, I, uh, I, you can hear I'm, I'm kind of, um, uh, hesitate to even talk about it because it's the thing I'm not proud of, which is that I was um, leaning on the um, Los Angeles Police Department for help managing the stalking case. And I was um, uh, so I was going through this whole thing, the criminal process, um, a process at school, addressing the crisis of being stalked and harassed and watching um, the securitization of my campus and the militarization of policing on the campus. Um, and uh, it was a very overwhelming, uh, I'll say, um, thing to go through. Um, and one thing that really startled me and made me really stop and think um, and push me to write was, um, and this has a lot to do with the luck of uh, where I live. I, I live in Los Angeles, which has uh, the world's first anti-stalking policing unit. Um, uh, and that's because there are so many celebrities who live in Los Angeles. And there was a terrible murder of a television actress in the 1980s by someone who had stalked her. And this led to the creation of an anti-stalking unit. And um, it's a fairly unique form of policing because it's um, organized around preventative policing. Um, you know, So if you're a stalking victim, you're trying to actually get a person to stop stalking you and, uh, you know, and to find ways to protect yourself from threats of harm. Right. And so from a uh, somebody who's working in that line of policing, um, when people end up going to jail or prison, it's because there's been a failure right in the um, um, in, in the engagement with the um, abuser in that situation. Right. So um, it was a very I was very lucky had I been in almost any other part of my region, I would not have had access to people who were trained in de-escalating techniques and um, very uh, good and grounded uh, risk assessment. Uh, and the LAPD actually did manage to bring the stalking under control. Uh, but the university's behavior was the exact opposite and that the university seemed to just by instinct move into escalating um, um, dynamics um, and partly because the only kind of outcome that the university could produce for itself was the identification of my stalker as a stalker with the aim of kicking her out of school. Right. And um, and which is a really like kind of high stakes kind of escalating confrontation, um, a kind of all or nothing sort of confrontation. Um, anyway, it was just a it just got me thinking um, about how attractive the uh, within the administrative st structure of the university, it seemed to be very attracted to the idea of protecting me and policing the person who was stalking me. Um, and, uh, and it was oh, just, just harmful. Right. So anyway, um, yeah, that's, that's kind of, that's where the book came from. Um, but the book is actually not about my stalking case. And so this is something that I wanted to talk a little bit about with today. And it's one of the things I tend to talk about, um, with people when it comes to, you know, just thinking as a scholar about harassment and also some, these are things I want to communicate to people who might be a member of a community that's impacted by harassment write students and writers who are trying to think about how do I write about harassment you know and for me as a victim uh you know I wanted the person who is harassing me to stop harassing me you know and that was the main thing um uh I didn't write about my case because then right because to do so would have been um you know I'd be confronting her in a way, and and drawing the crisis into a different sphere, into the sphere of publicity, and creating more platforms through which she could harass me. Um, and so, people who are victims of harassment are very frequently trapped by this. Um, and this may be people who are it's like interpersonal dynamics, but it might also be people who are being victimized um, by, say, far right um, um, extremism and targeted for harassment online, where you're caught and a little bit frozen in place because especially if you're working around a political issue where you're trying to raise awareness, 
um, just entering into the public sphere, um, um, into the discursive sphere as a target, will bring on bring more harassment, um, and um, and people um, struggle to figure out how to support um, victims um, of that of that form of harassment in particular. Um, and so one of the strange effects of what I went through is that it made me, I think, a better ally to friends of um, and um, colleagues who work on Palestine in particular, uh, which is an issue where scholars working on Palestine have been um, singled out and targeted for organized harassment um, over many, many years. Um, and uh, just you know, standing up and identifying yourself um, um, as um, on their side um, and as anti-harassment activists on that front um, will bring harassment to you, right? So it, it's um um and it, it's a terrible a terrible ecology, and this is what I mean by ecologies of harassment is that once you get into once you um, um encounter a harassing harassment dynamic, most people, um at least in my experience socially and in the workplace, uh, hesitate to step in, right? For 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 fear, right? That um, um they are going to get kind of like pulled into the undertow, um and um. Yeah, and overwhelmed by it, right? So, um, uh, campus sex, campus security isn't about that. It's actually though a, a book that was written. It was like I was trying to find a way to talk about harassment without engaging and participating in those kinds of harassing ecologies. Um, and so it's structured so that it has like these sort of vin these vin vignettes. It has very short chapters, and many of them are summaries of quite specific cases. Uh, so there's a case of police violence at UC Davis in 2011, I think, which is uh, called, famously called the pepper spray cop incident. It was a UC, University of California police officer who soaked seated pa uh, passive peaceful demonstrators with a can of pepper spray. Um, there was an incident of a student at UCLA who um, is a man um, of uh, Middle Eastern background, and he was asked to show student ID in the library. And I'm just gonna say in that library in UCLA, I don't even think you can get in the library without showing your student ID. So it was a weird request. He refused to show it. And they called in the campus police who then tased him. Um, and um, only because they wanted to escort him out. And he went limp as you do uh, in demonstrations and um, police are trying to move you. So instead of fighting the police, you just go limp. And that's what he did. And they tased him to try to force him to get up and walk out. Um, and they tased him for something like five or six minutes. It's one of the first viral videos um, documenting police violence. This is dated to 2007. Um, it's called the UC, UCLA taser incident or UCLA library taser incident. Um, um, I write about that case in um, uh, Tyler Clementi's um, suicide. Um, it's a student who spied on him um, having um, a sexual encounter in the dorm room. Do I picked cases um, that had that were in the past and that around which there was a kind of a case literature. And then I, I wrote about the cases from the existing case literature. And when I was writing Campus Sex, Campus Security, this is, I published it in 2015. Um, Emma Sulkowitz's case was happening at Columbia. So this is an undergraduate student who accused um, a man um, who had been a boyfriend of hers of uh, sexual assault, and um, and then she was carrying a mattress around with her because she wanted him to be expelled. Um, I didn't write about that case because at that time I I couldn't. The material that was available from Columbia was very partial um, and unresolved. Um, and uh, to be quite frank, I couldn't figure out how to write about it without. In essence, I you know I was trying to keep in open the possibility, like thinking like if I was a journalist, I would be thinking about um, trying to balance taking her complaint seriously and taking his complaint seriously because he accused her of harassing him, um, and he actually sued the university for not um, protecting him from that harassment. And technically, what she was doing because it was associated with the demand to have him expelled. Is harassment, right? So, I was I was like I I don't know how to write about this in a way that doesn't inflict harm on one party or another, right? So everything I wrote, I was trying to like pressure. Am I contributing to harm? Uh, get towards Sulkowitz by both sidesing this story, right? Am I contributing to harm to this guy? Should 
like what's hap what his should his narrative be true and accurate right like i couldn't i couldn't find a good answer to that um and so i went through i, I wrote about the penn state um 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 a huge case involving a support staff on the football team who used his position to sexually abuse um at risk uh minors um jerry sandusky and that had been in fully investigated right so campus sex, sex campus security is based on existing case literature or reporting as in the case of ursula ore who is an arizona state university professor who was um, assaulted by campus police um, who wanted her to show her ID. Uh, she's African-American and um, um, works in rhetoric. And um, that was the case that was the freshest, I'll say, of all the things that I wrote about. So anyway, I, you know, Campus 6 Campus Security was um, written at a remove from my own case. And then I, after that book was published, um, this horrible thing happened, which there was a, a sexual harassment case in my department. Um, and uh, so the book was published in 2015, and that case started in this, you know, but when this book was in press in the winter of 2014, and that man wasn't fired, uh, his name was Rob Latham, until January 2016, although he was on leave that whole time, so he wasn't around. Um, and so I didn't really do any publicity around my book, um, because my department was in the middle of a harassment, you know, another harassment case. There was a lot of, um, yeah, there was a lot of harassment just going on inside the department and um, and around it um, um, and and around this case, and I was anxious about bringing any publicity to my department, so I just sort of got quiet um, as a scholar, um, and and watched the country get kind of possessed by um, stories. And this is also very true in Canada as well, because this time period, like 2015, 2016, 2017, Me Too was, um, um, and Me Too within academia, um, you know, it's like a thing, right? Um, and as much as we were talking about sexual harassment in the academy, like before that, um, Me Too um, sharpened its focus and it created, it, it really was like a zeitgeist, sh zeitgeist shift insofar as you're really working in the hinterlands by working on sexual harassment. You know, and people would just tell me not to write about my own case or not to write about harassment because you're going to be identified with this issue forever and it's going to really narrow the impact of your work. Um, literally, that you know, got that advice from numbers of people with experience to actually know what they were talking about too, because that's real. Um, but Me Too kind of shifted that a bit and it actually, I'd say, made it, um, created bigger spaces of conversation, but also at the same time, a bigger and kind of problematic media market for um, stories about cases. Um, and around this time, Laura Kipnis published um, Unwanted Advances, um, which I have not ever written about because she discusses the harassment case in my department in that book, only from the perspective of the accused, in which she represents him as being persecuted by people with secret agendas and um, and represents him as it's a moment when she describes queer faculty as targets for un um, uh, for false accusations and um, she basically weaponizes um, um, the whole apparatus of the sexual harassment complaint in that kind of space and um, you know by suggesting right that the people who are most vulnerable to false accusations are queer faculty and that this is like a real and widespread phenomenon the problem with that narrative right is that there was a male victim right there was a male victim and homophobia if it works and if it's going to have a very powerful impact on the administration of a case involving same-sex abuse it's going to be people who are victimized within same sex dynamics who are going to suffer the most for that. Um, and uh, that's that's mainstreamed, I'll say, even within the spaces of queer theory as sort of tenured faculty of my generation and late and, and older were sort of attracted to this narrative, you know, partly because it's also like it's not not true, right? And so far as even the administration of my own case, which is a same sex harassment case and some female graduate student harassing me. Um, the the ways in which my own case was mishandled had everything to do, I would say, with the combination of mis misogyny and homophobia amongst faculty who were sitting on committees who were hearing the case. 
Um, and that was the same case with Rob Latham as well, although it, the, the complaints against him were supported, the primary complaint filed by the male victim was not because a committee of nine people, eight men and one woman, were not inclined to believe the male victim who came forward with the complaint, right? So um, anyway, you know, like these kinds of stories are really like hard um, and they're networked into like broader problems within our institutions. And I think this is what I'm here to talk about today, right? So, you know, I think a lot, you know, people get very wary about the administration of harassment complaints within the neoliberal institution, for example, because there's some ways in which it does seem to make things worse just generally, right? Um, and one of the things that I know, I you know, and, and this is, I'm speaking as somebody who works at a very large public institution. Um, and, um, and so my experiences of the administration of sexual harassment complaints I recognize are quite particular to that, um, um, the sociology of the institution that I work in. And I think, you know, scale is a really important story when we're talking about groups and institutions and how they manage harassment and abuse. Um, but, you know, amongst my colleagues, uh, the most attractive narrative is something like um, the institution won't love you back. Um, uh, you're kind of like a fool for expecting the institution to look after you and protect you. You know, there's a kind of cynicism and paranoia that's really normalized. Um, and you kind of feel foolish in a sense, really, if you've been you're dealing with harassment and you try to actually make the institution kind of help you like figure it out and then it goes wrong and then you're betrayed and you know like it, it sort of you know the places where you trust the institution become places where you know you, you're that trust is betrayed and you feel foolish for having trusted the institution right so I've been really interested partly as somebody who's trained in literary criticism in the work that 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 word institution does in these stories right and, it's, and I'm going to say this as somebody who's been, not, I've been through one case as a victim and then another case as a heavily impacted colleague, right, in a department. And the things that made those cases awful was not some abstract entity called an institution. It was actually existing people within our community, right? Um, and um, it's people who are sitting on committees and who, right, don't know, like are um, uncomfortable with any conversation about sex, gender, and sexuality, for example. Um, who have not even remedial knowledge with regards to sex, gender, and sexuality. Um, most faculty at the University of California, Riverside, and I'm going to say, I'm going to even say most faculty on the left, right, <laughs> have not even remedial knowledge on the subject because they've never even taken a class in gender studies, right? So, you know, um, you're, and when we turn to our communities for to, for assistance in working through the harm that's caused by sexualized forms of abuse, for example, um, the, um, we struggle with this thing, right? You know, so in a sense, I, it's like a weird, like a weirdly pessimistic and also optimistic. Think of some part of me as like, there's a pessimism in that. And so far as, you know, I'm just like, yeah, most of my colleagues are, you know, are sexist and, you know, it's not insignificant number are misogynist and, um, and even the ones who want to say they're not homophobes, they're not comfortable with LGBTQ anything, and they're really useless in these kinds of situations, if not worse than useless, right? But there's another part of me, which is the educator and the person who went into like feminist study, right? You know, radical feminist theory and queer theory. Like I went into those fields because it's the area in which I want to do the work. And so I feel like I can see the work that needs to be done, you know? So it, I have a kind of push pull around this in terms of like, um, um, or, you know, and clear ambivalence, I'll say. Anyway, I'm speaking, I recognize I'm speaking very kind of broadly, you know, but, um, um, you know, the arc of my work is, you know, starts from a place of being victimized um, and also victimized by a student, which is for a teacher, an extremely emotionally difficult situation. I'm going to say not just as somebody passed through my classroom, but somebody in whom I was invested as a mentor. Um, um, and then like, you know, thinking about what I went through in context, you know, and then recognizing I wanted to write from experience, but that I couldn't. And, um, um, and then, you know, I actually got interested in, I guess, like case literature, because it was a way for me to like work through my own experience. And so I've just finished a manuscript that does actually quite explicitly tell the story of my own case. And it's not unrelated to harassment because I only wrote it because Rob Latham was, um, you know, in a nadir in the administration of his own case and the kind of years of fallout of it, 
was sending me emails every couple of months saying he was going to write a story about how I was the real sexual harasser in my department. And, um, and uh, he was selling that narrative to uh, people in the United States who have quite a platform, Laura Kipnis um, and um, Brian Leiter, who runs a terrible um, kind of Drudge Report style blog where um, he kind of covers stories, pub, you know, like publishes s stories about cases and rumors about harassment. And he really loves stories that involve women who harass. Um, and he, you know, wrote a couple entries about me um, and he didn't say anything about my case, but he literally threatened on his blog, which is must be read by like tens of thousands of people a day, I'm guessing from the traffic um, that came to my own um, website through his website, which I could see in my analytics. Anyway, um, it was just alarming. And so I wrote my narrative down to inoculate myself because I was like, well, if if somebody's going to try to tell the story about when I was stalked by one of my students and I accused her of sexual harassment and a faculty committee actually found her innocent, right, of sexual harassment that actually happened. Um, I'm gonna tell the story of how that happened and what that was about. So I wrote it all out and, um, and then I started reading it as um, a monologue and um, I've since published it in a very unsexy anthology of, um, in a, of, of a work in security studies. I wanted to kind of bury it in um, and a very highly academic context, although it's really a mon you know it's a monologue, and that now I'm kind of bringing that out, and I'm sitting here. I am worried about telling the story in a more uh, visible platform, but at the same time, it happened a long time ago, and I'm in a different place. As is the woman who was stalking me. I, you know, I think that um, whatever I, you know, I don't. She's not a monster in the narrative, and so I, I think the writing might not be harmful, but. I started also writing about um, different kinds of harassment cases, and that's where I'm going to stop. Um, um, it's just by kind of pointing to this kind of large and looming question for all of us. I don't know if in Canada you have cases like the Larry Nassar case. Well, you do in sports, what am I saying? You know, this is all over um, Canadian sports. Um, um, Larry Nassar was a physiotherapist, and he was um, uh, uh, using that position to abuse generations of gymnasts um, competing for the USA National Gymnastics Program and also athletes getting treatment um, at Michigan State University and also within gymnast gym gyms in his area in Michigan. Um, I wrote about that case and, um, uh, and there's a whole cluster of them and uh, meaning of uh, physiotherapists and gynecologists and doctors working at universities who've abused you know, hundreds of people, um, if not even more. Um, and there've been only more cases uncovered since the Nassar case. And there are similar cases in sports to the, you know, to the Sandusky case going back to Penn State. That, that case was, I want to say that came out in like 2008, 2009. And that was quite a while ago. Um, but as somebody who also works in sports studies, it's been just this kind of really difficult story for people working in sports. And so far as I don't know anyone who works in women's sports who hasn't known as long as you've worked in women's sports, that this is an issue in women's sports and in men's sports too. Um, and Me Too actually made it possible for journalists to actually report them. Um, but we live with the kind of just, just big question about what it is what is it about these particular kinds of institutions that seems to make um, them uh, harass, it's their like hothouses for really specific forms of harassment and abuse, I'd say. Because uh, here we have, these are kind of stories of individuals who are harassing on a mass scale. <laughs> and um, I've, you know, as somebody who works in queer theory, if, you know, it's really, I've never, I've yet to find a good way to write about it, but it's really, I've struggled with watching, like, say, for example, everybody has a think piece about the case involving Avital Renell from a few years ago, um, who's an NYU um, faculty member and philosopher, a woman who's accused by a male graduate student of sexual harassment. But um, you know, very few people write about these other cases involving full, you know, fully incorporated into the institution forms of sexual harassment and abuse, right? One is scandalous and one is like inherently interesting, and the other one is like an administrative problem, right? Um, like the the literature around these cases are it's like almost abstract to try to read the Nassar files and the like. I mean, as horrifying as their details are it becomes a story about institutions um, um, rather than the story about individuals. But as theorists, for some reason, it's the individual cases that seem to be the ones that people wanna 
you know, cut their teeth on or stake their flag in or whatever. So anyway, so I know this is a very kind of broad and general sort of conversation. Um, but, you know, I'm very keen to, you know, um, uh, uh, be in conversation and um, take questions or if there are aspects of a kind of story of thinking about harassment in institutions and the administration of complaints that people want questions about. Um, if anybody wants to speak from an administrative point of view, you know, like, um, um, I'm very happy to, um, uh, to talk about anything like that. <laughs> Thank you so much. <laughs> um, I don't know if, if how Zoom webinars work all the time, but I felt like a bobbing head because I was agreeing <laughs> with so much with what you were saying. And um, I think just for me had a lot of, have a lot of resident resonance. Um, and I really appreciated how you um, spoke about this ecology of harassment and how it can pull us in or we seek not to be part of it even as we are um, mm -hmm and what it can open up and the barriers uh, those aren't your words this is this is my words um that that really um resonated with me and I think is part and parcel of the um, I don't know if resistance is the right word but the difficulties of of senior administration dealing with harassment complaints and sexual harassment complaints is that is that broader ecology um yeah Christina I don't know if you had anything to add um, yeah, well, from another bobbing head um, over here, I would say that another point that you made that um, I that I just thought, God, that's exactly right, is your. I loved how you kind of complicated or critiqued the idea of the institution. It's the institution mm -hmm. that says, yes, mm -hmm. but it's people. It's mm -hmm. our communities. Absolutely. And I think that that is. And I could see why, you know, resorting to the language of institution might be a survival strategy in some of those, in some cases, because it, because it is so close to home and it is, yeah, no, it is. Uh, yeah. Like one of the things too, I, it's like, I think when you're going through harassment cases or, you know, harassment discrimination cases, I'm um, going to put those two things together because um, there, you kind of can't get to discrimination without harassment or you can, but. Um, they're often um, um, uh, really embedded, um, uh, and uh, at least in the United States, to a lot of the the laws and the regulations that we grapple with are really meant to identify the ways that these things are related. Um, mm -hmm. Like, you know, Title IX, right? Is a um, it's an amendment to the Higher Education Act, which funds mm -hmm. public education, you know, and it and it prohibits the use of sex as a barrier to ed to educational opportunity. Um, and then there's like this, and you know, it, what the very first cases that put Title IX to use, and this is an echo of what happens in employment law in the United States, identify sexual harassment as an um, uh, a tool, in essence, right? For it's a as a barrier, right? That, um, and so you know, they, these cases, I you know, are ones in which people file complaints because they're being sexually harassed um, at school or at work. And um, the you know the um, defendant right the the school or the employer says oh we're not discriminating right and um, you know this is just like talk or this is just this coach's behavior you know and um, this isn't discrimination and then at some point in those cases a judge you know was like no this form of behavior is a barrier um, and it you know it's like if you have to put up or shut up. Um, um, that that's actually an obstacle, right? So those cases are really important because they set this precedent for sexual harassment as a part of the apparatus, which actually mm -hmm. limits people's sort of movement. Um, mm -hmm. When you're in a case, what you start to, what a case kind of brings out is like, you start to discover that you have different relations, that you and your colleagues have different relationships to the institution, mm -hmm. right? And that a case will actually like throw those differences into stark relief. Mm -hmm. um, and you may find also within yourself that you adopt and move through different kinds of positions in mm -hmm. relationship to the institution, mm -hmm. right? So like you feel angry and betrayed by the institution, but then you want the institution to protect you, you know? Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, mm -hmm. there's like a, oh, mm -hmm. it's a, 
I don't, and you know, I've been humbled also, I'll say as somebody who works in the arts and as a queer theorist and by work that's happened in like feminist management studies. Yeah. You know, like there's a book for, from the seventies, you know, a feminist, it's a feminist critique of bureaucracy. It's like the feminist case against bureaucracy is the name of a book. And that's partly about the way the bureaucracy is thrown at women, right? In the workplace yeah. to prevent you from being able to move through the workplace. Um, and um, uh, and then of course, there's a really robust feminist critique of the feminist case against bureaucracy, um, mm -hmm. all of which to my mind uh, anticipates Moten and Harney's work in the undercommons, mm -hmm. right? There's actually like this incredible rhyming that happens between their critique of the neoliberal institution um, and the privatization of the institution and what that looks like. And then feminist, you know, examination and exploration of workplace dynamics and organizational dynamics. Um, anyway, I can see there's a comment in the Q&A. Mm. Yeah, it's a question from Dana Daniels. Um, thank you for that question, Dana. Um, I can read it out. Um, and then I have uh, something I would like to share after that. So yeah. uh, Dana Daniels says, um, did you find ostracism or at least separation from you by colleagues who did not want to be tainted by association with you, um, even though your situation could, or I'm wondering if it meant, if, it, yeah. if, if Dana meant to say, could not directly oh, impact them? Yeah, yeah. Uh, uh, Dana, that's a great question. It's like, yes and no, it's so complex, you know, especially in my case, which uh, stock, it went on for like a couple of years and then had the late the Latham thing happened. And um, um, and it's one of those things you kind of can't quite put it on individuals. It's really like a group phenomenon. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, you can, right? And you do emotionally, but at the same time, it's like a group dynamic. Um, and so, and then there's also like, so yes, insofar as, and this is the cleanest way of answering that question, I was the one who was being stalked, right? And um, and I was the one, you know, the, Latham was harassing a handful of people and we were all kind of like alone and kind of carrying that. And that, there was like, I don't want to compare the way he was behaving towards me to the, how he was behaving towards victims or how my stalker was behaving towards me, you know, um, but, um, you know, when people are coming for you, they're, they're coming for you, right? And um, mm -hmm. and then people can support you, but they're, you're, they're not living with the burdens of it and it's not infecting them and their lives. Like it, it, what happened to me infected my personal life, you know, and um, my colleagues aren't there around to witness that. And I don't want them to be because they're my colleagues. Um, but also, you know, sexualized forms of harassment. I will put this out as like, an, you know, I think sexualized forms of harassment in particular um, feel private. And mm -hmm. as a victim, you can be slow to recognize, right? That what's happening to you is like a workplace problem and needs to be shared and treated as such. And so things for me really turned around when I started being really explicit about what was happening to me. Mm -hmm. And I was actually started reading things that Latham was sending me in by email, for example, into the department meeting minutes. Oh my God. I, yeah, because oh I was just like, I don't know how else to share what what this feels like. You know, and I, um, and, you know, and especially if you're in a case that's uh, underway in terms of its administration, where people can't tell who the real victim is, mm. right? you know, that people get really isolated in that and, um, and people's caution about engaging it is coming from a good place, right? It's not, right, that's not necessarily bad behavior for look, hanging back because you're trying to like figure out what's really going on and you don't want to make things worse right so it is you know i i in fact i'm not sure there's a way to un experience harassment without also experiencing some isolation around yeah. it yeah. Mm. yeah yeah that's such an important point thank you so there's there's another question um that i will share in one second but i also wanted to say that um uh yeah this was just this is um so thought provoking and um heavy. I've actually gotten an email from a student who I know is here. Um, thanks for sending that email, basically saying, are, are you, are professors okay? Um, is, are, there, <laughs> are there supports for faculty? And I think that this, that just kind of revealing to our students, right? That, yeah. That oh, this, yeah. 
that this it's, too is what this oh, yeah. is what, my, and how do we talk about that right my whole case I thank you to yeah. that student for sending you that email I just like and it's like the yeah. thing that to my heart you know it goes right, right. to the heart yeah you know because like my well, there was an awful turn in my case where I was trying to talk to a couple of my undergraduate students about what was happening because the stalker had befriended them and was mentoring them and then was using them as tools in the stalking campaign I didn't oh. know how true that was when this when the following happened but I had a yeah. I, I had asked people at school to talk to these students because I felt awkward about it. And yeah, um, I think, you know, things got so much worse before, after this. But, you know, I took this one student aside and I was like, I, you know, I need to talk to you about this person. And I know this sounds crazy. And I minimized all over the place. Right. Yeah. I minimized. I was like, I had to file this harassment complaint. I don't really feel harassed, you know, and or, you know, and I, I was just I just minimized all over the place because she was in my class. Oh, but I yeah. didn't want her worried about me. Yeah. But what was yeah. going on is she actually recorded the conversation. And then that was played in the hearing for oh, the person who was stalking me. And so there was an audio recording of me saying, I don't feel harassed. <gasps> oh, oh wow. can't make this stuff up, right? <laughs> so to that student, he's like, our professor's okay. We're fine. You know what I mean? People go through this stuff, you know, like, <laughs> almost any workplace like I you know I, especially like a big kind of complicated workplace you know yeah. you know you live long enough and you go through stuff and mm. um you know and so um uh you know I it's you know it, it's and I'll say it's just that it's hard to talk about this I'll say as a faculty member in and in conversation with students because it's hard for us to be vulnerable to students mm -hmm. and that I know um and also the more I work on harassment the more aware I am of how easy it is to groom students. You know what I mean? And so mm -hmm. far as you're in a position where you can weaponize your vulnerabilities, right? Mm -hmm. And that's kind of like, you know, as I've been, you know, some of the harassment cases that I've studied, this is part of the story, you know, is where um, um, the kind of power difference between the student and a faculty member gets kind of broken down. Mm -hmm. And one way the faculty member breaks that down, right, is by being vulnerable to students. So I, I definitely find myself feeling very mindful about all of that. But, yeah. you know, nobody's yeah. really okay in this historical moment, but I'm fine. <laughs> Um, well, that's, I think that's also yeah. true. Oh my gosh. And before I get to um, the next question up, I wanted to say as well that your talk in this discussion has made me think of um, a piece that Kyla Wazana Tompkins published yeah. in um, PMLA a couple of, yeah, maybe two years ago, yeah. last year, called The Shush. And yeah. And, and I heard her talk about it on a podcast and my head exploded. And then I read the actual piece and I have, I keep returning yeah. to it. Um, I yeah. think partly because in, in our institutional context, so the University of Lethbridge is, I would also say, a catastrophically under-resourced institution. And so, and I would say that kind of questions of reputation management are part and parcel of that. And so just when she says um, that, you know, that she had to name the shush of coerced non-disclosure under so under which so many of us live our institutional lives mm -hmm. and and the heaviness of this moment right that you said you know there's so many intersecting crises that yeah, yeah. i mean i well i think i'm going to try to respond to what you said while also acknowledging the comments that are oh there right okay. um great thank you you know so um I actually, uh, you know, it's funny. But I, I actually don't think reputation management is the problem. Mm. You know what I mean? Like, because it's so much deeper than that. And you look at, you have to look to the Nilari Nassar case for an example of that. Oh, right? yes, absolutely. It's like, yep. it's like if you knew that a member of your team was sexually molesting children, you know, it's like the desire to manage the reputation should be very rapidly quashed. Right. I mean, to, you know, I mean, it's just like the the you would it seems in the interest of the reputation of the institution to confront that. Right. So, you know, I think it's quite deep. Right. And so it, you know, and maybe reputation management is a part of the story if only if we can make it edible. Right. Insofar mm -hmm. as, you know, that it touches on really deep personal issues that we all have mm -hmm. right around sexuality and power mm -hmm. um, and um, vulnerability and power. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, and, and, and just what, like the, the, I, you know, it's just really, it's really heavy, mm -hmm. you know, it's just really heavy. I mean, the Nassar case is an incredible example of it. I mean, there's this case 
that I write about of Amanda Tomashaw, who, you know, is um, a 20 something year old woman who filed a complaint against NASA in 2014, mm -hmm. and it was investigated by the institution, mm -hmm. Michigan State, and they, NASA said, oh, you know, she must have been victimized when she was young. And so she's mistaking massage for sexual assault because she's traumatized. That's what mm -hmm. he said. Wow. Um, and, um, and the school believed him so much that when they called her into the office to say they were dismissing her complaint against him, they actually handed her a pamphlet for victims of sexual violence. So oh. it's like, to me, at my mind, that's not reputation management, right? That's like the difficulty of acknowledging that you have abuse in your community, right? Mm -hmm. That that is like that is a very it's like we all want to be the person who calls it out, <laughs> you know. But it's a really deep it's a really deep issues, and it touches on many of our own family dynamics, you know. It's like yeah. it's just so heavy. So, yeah. you know, it's, so I'm a little resi I resist the reputation management narrative a little bit because, um, and especially when you start working with people who administer cases, mm -hmm. you, know, you can see just like how it's just like really heavy and difficult work. So the questions here, uh, Devin, my own, I work at UC Riverside. Um, my relationship to the University of California is deeply scarred. And I've tried to leave actually a couple points just because I haven't felt I could fix it. Um, and, um, you know, and I do think about retirement more actively than I think most people at my point do. Right, so I, you know, and I think that's quite normal um, for people. I mean, my institution it has a particularly bad history when it comes to senior women academics, especially women who are older than me. Um, and so, if anything, one of the things that helps me, and this goes a little bit to Tasha's question, and it's not about like policy or anything, but it's that you know, if you there are always people around you who've been through it, or not always, but there are usually people around you who've been through it at your own institution or others. And there's mentoring that happens in the same way that there's mentoring in a positive sense. There's mentoring in terms of crisis management and dealing with these things, um, you know. And so, I, I could kind of see some of what was coming. And so far as I've watched other colleagues withdraw, become bitter, um, angry, right? Like, and I see my own tendencies in that, and it helps me to have some insight about those tendencies in myself. Um, mm -hmm. I, I tried in the beginning of my own case, I, I made a case out of my case. I filed an employment discrimination case about the way my case was handled. And my argument was that there were sm a few small things that I desperately needed to restore my relationship as a potential leader on campus, right? right. I was just like, I, you know, I want, you know, like I want to have a pathway that looks like me chairing the department or being a dean or, you know, running the art center on campus or something like that none of those things will ever happen on my campus. I just don't think it will ever happen. And um, yeah, and I don't and I don't think there's anything that I can do about it. And I've stopped trying and mm -hmm. I've tried to try to put my energies more towards things that are, you know, uh, don't hurt me. <laughs> mm -hmm. You know, so it's sort of like, you know, mm -hmm. so I've had to manage uh, my, you know, manage a lot of these things myself, but part of that is about looking around the institution, mm -hmm. looking at my colleagues around me, outside my department, my department is a very good department, I want to say, you know, we just went through some really terrible things. And, um, but I, you know, I kind of almost need like uh, to move yeah. my environment and change my setting and, you know, kind of sage my, mm -hmm. my relationship to my work. So yeah. that's how it works. And then Tasha, I don't, I haven't really seen anything that feels I it's more that I've seen a scholarship that I think can be helpful um so there's a quite well-known scholar named Jennifer um Freyd or Fried it's F-R-E-Y-D um and she had a group that studied um institutional betrayal I think they were based at the University of Oregon and she might have moved to Stanford um and um and they were called like the betrayal lab. And basically they studied betrayal trauma and their work started mm -hmm. to turn to the study of trauma betrayal within institutional settings. Wow. And all I'll of that. Link, I'll put the link in the chat. I will say yeah. I, 
I, I am familiar with this work from yeah. other parts of my own institutional <laughs> trying to make sense of life. So, yeah. Yeah. you know, she, I mean, it, it's very Ted talky in a certain way. Like there's a whole, she has this concept, institutional courage, right? Where, which is really about encouraging institutions to basically do the things they're most afraid of. And you can see where that kind of um, no doubt um, consulting practice is having an impact, you know, because where you see institutions that are apologizing, right, and acknowledging and apologizing and are doing so with participation from the from victims and victims, the impacted communities, that's where you see institutions really kind of shifting in their own behavior. Um, yeah, so that, that's, that really comes from scholarship, I'd say, from scholars and um, 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 working in that space. Um, I've received an email with a question uh, from someone who wishes to be anonymous, so I'll just read the question. Um, this is such a well-timed discussion for our university, who, in my perspective, has been slow to draft exacting or feminist or queer informed policies on internal matter matters of interest staff harassment, bullying, et cetera, as well as student bullying and faculty harassment of students, et cetera. Yes, Christine, we are cat catastrophically under-resourced. Jennifer, I wonder if the university needs to design a way to produce an external open reporting of cases addressed ongoing or resolved as one way of moving towards transparency? Or do you have some other practical measures that might be implemented? This might grant some reassurance that bureaucracies are actively aspiring to solve the many problems we all confront. I think one of the less, that's a great and very moving uh, account of um, the situation at your institution um, and just beautifully said. Um, one of the things I've been I've been thinking about ever since I first read this, right, was um, uh, sorry, was it Mary Koss? Uh, she's a scholar who works on uh, restorative justice programs within mm. criminal court systems. Mm. You know, see, these are also known as diversion programs. Mm. So it might be something that a family might use um, in order to um, confront uh, an abusive family member's behavior and the harm that they've done. Um, and to keep them out of jail, right? So, because it's basically a court, um, it's done in collaboration with courts. And I think um, she she's written about the use of this program in Arizona of all places. Um, I just say that because <laughs> it's one of the most infamously awful um, in terms of uh, the uh, criminal justice system there. But, um, and um, in uh, those kinds of programs, you know, you have somebody who's being accused of a form of ongoing violence and harassment and abuse. Um, and if it's like the threat is putting them in jail or prison rather. Mm -hmm. And the program, there's an incentive in there, right? Because he, that's taken off the table if they participate in this process, right? So, um, and that's a process that involves the victim, the accused and their communities. And they collaborate in trying to find a way to acknowledge and address the harm that's been done and to ensure the safety of those who've been impacted by that abuse. One of the things uh, that um, scholars who write about those kinds of programs observe is that there's no incentive to participate in them if the possibility of sending someone to prison is not taken off the table. Mm -hmm. So one of the things that I feel happens within the campus environment is that expulsion for students is always on the table. Or it feels like it's all, it feels like if, you know, when you, it's like when you set policies a certain way, the student has a very high, a sense of very high risk of expulsion that disincentivizes participation in any campus-based process, right? A campus-based process generally is not too far from what we mean by restorative justice, right? Um, you know, that the end of a student conduct process is not that someone goes to jail, right? But it may well be that they're expelled from the community, you know? Mm -hmm. And in the case of my, uh, the person who was stalking me, the campus insisted on holding this a hearing, which I refused to participate in for all kinds of reasons. 
because they wanted it on the record that she had done what she did, so she could never be admitted into any graduate program in the University of California system ever. And that was not my ask as a victim, right? Not my, I was like, well, what if she gets to a good place? You know, like, what if we can find a way for her to restore her relationship mm -hmm. to her work? What if we can acknowledge this as a mental health crisis and just put the brakes on this mm -hmm. person's studies until they get, you know what? I just was like, mm -hmm. this makes no sense and it doesn't do anything for anyone, right? So in terms of, you know, if I was going to encourage some people who are setting up a process, if I was going to encourage people to think about it, and this is true for faculty as well, right? You know, it's like, how do you, how do you, you know, it's like, how do you make space for the conversation about everything that is not the most dramatic, right, and punitive? Mm -hmm. um, and I'm going to say, like, for faculty, um, you know, in the United States, so we have a very particular tenure process, um, which is very much mystified, you know, it's mystified to such a degree that faculty that, who are tenured professors, it's quite normal for people to think they can never be fired, which is not true, right? And nor do, should it should it be true, you know? So um, um, I work within a system, it's like my, a friend of mine, um, uh, a very wise woman, uh, not in the academy, uh, said the academy is like a, the church and the military. Yeah. You know, right. And so far as uh, people in it have very little experience outside of it. And should you lose your job, you're afraid you're going to be able, you're not going to be able to support yourself. Um, and so like the stakes are, are made so high um, by the culture of our work, um, yeah. and which is attached to the privilege attached to tenured professors that does not attach to any other employee in the university. Um, you know, that there's a toxic that's a toxic force within the ecosystem that we work in, um, you know, and uh, because uh, the stakes of confronting someone around that harassment are so high, it can feel like you're at risk of, um, of, of seeing someone destroyed should a complaint be filed. Mm -hmm. But you want an environment where people can complain and it is not necessarily catastrophic to do so, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Even if the complaint is justified. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I learned a lot from the, stalking literature because like stalking is like the worst form of harassment but it shares something with all harassment dynamics you know which is that things get worse when the stakes get higher yeah um you know that it just like the harassment dynamic intensifies and things start to take on a life or deathy kind of quality mm -hmm. um and um and it can make it really impossible to do your work never mind enjoy your work and I'll say that's a real kind of insight that I hope is alive in shadow of my shadow, right? Which is that for me, and this goes back to the earlier questions about institutions and like the first question about my relationship to the institution, you know, was that what happened really threatened my ability. And it's, it's actually, I'd say, had a very harmful effect on my ability to enjoy my job. Yeah. And that I experienced an enormous amount of grief around that. And I think that's probably true for any kind of workplace kind of trauma like that is that it's, we tend to talk about it and whether or not you can do the job, but it's, I think the source of grief, especially in a job like this is feeling like whether you can enjoy it again. Right. Um, and that's not, not all that different from the way that traumas inhabit our, you know, form, you know, intimate relationships too. Right. So anyway, yeah, that's a little dark, but <laughs> it's very real though, too. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm madly scribbling notes. There's uh, so much to think about. Um, yeah, Christine, thoughts? Yeah, um, I'm just, I, I'm wondering if there are any other comments uh, or questions from members of our virtual audience. <laughs> I wish, oops, I wish we were all in a room together. And yeah, I don't, yeah. I don't say that often. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, no, we've gotten pretty but I, yeah. yeah with this topic, but it's like, um, I don't know, I guess too, like, and maybe it's nice that we're online too, because it's like, I there's a lot of tender feelings around this stuff, you know, so, um, and so it's nice that people are able to email you anonymously. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, that's really true. Yeah, yeah. it's, it's yeah. important too. Mm -hmm. yeah. So, um, 
I love that question about like, are the professors okay? Um, <laughs> I just, I'm gonna go back to like an early moment with this for me, which was um, yeah. students, students invited me to a uh, small liberal arts college campus years ago, mm -hmm. uh, um, right after I published Campus Sex, Campus Security, and they were dealing with um, cases on their campus. And, um, and it was a conversation, you know, a bit like this. Um, and somebody, a student said, and the question was, it was just very simple. It was like, but what about our friends? And, um, you know, and I was like, what do you mean? And then they're like, well, there's this, there's something happening here. And we're all friends with everybody in the story, you know, and, mm -hmm. um, and, and they were really torn up about it and torn up about what to do. And there's no easy answer to that, you know, and I, I thought that was such a good and honest question from students. Um, and that's often, not always, but that's often what we're talking about within a university environment, right? It's like, but what about, it's like my work friend, right? It's like, like we might not be like, you know, uh, best buddies or, or the like, but we we um, are bonded together in a work environment that is very much anchored in a shared sense of ethics um, um, in, interests and um, uh, places where, our work and our lives are very much entangled and entwined. Yeah. And, um, and that, that's why we do what we do, um, you know, and uh, cases that arise within our own community are all very often really painful because it's really hard to hear, um, you know, that a member of your community is harmed and someone else in your community. And then it's hard to live with the anger mm -hmm. um, um, too, that grows up around that from, from everyone's side, you know, um, mm -hmm. There is no easy, there is no policy, mm -hmm. right? That um, will make it not, make it so that it hurts less. I just don't think so. I think you can, you know, just sort of absorbing these sorts of stories in our community. Mm -hmm. Policies, however, can make it worse. Mm -hmm. um, and then the, the turn to policy to fix the problem is not a fix of the problem. Right. Right. Um, no policy, there is no policy that will keep harassment out of your community, mm. right? That, uh, you know, and if when you study like group dynamics and group, um, um, you realize like that's, it's like, I, this is why I love the language of an ecology because it's like, um, um, it's like tending to the community, mm. you know, yeah. it's like that you have to actually do that actively. Um, yeah right, that harassment arises out of a kind of neglect. You can't just like plant a garden and ignore it. <laughs> you know, oh, wow. yeah, yeah, you have to pull weeds, right? You have to flower, you know, it's a corny kind of thing to say, but harassment is a toxic, uh, um, it's like a pollutant um, that kind of arises, I think quite naturally. Um, um, and, you know, and it's, uh, um, it's biases and um, prejudices and antipathies, right, that will turn away from them or direct them, heap them on one member of the community, at, you know, so that no one else suffers, right, you know what I mean, like it kind of does a, um, the, it functions within a group and a group ecology and the group sustains harassment, you know, um, and um, it doesn't have to, but it has to acknowledge that this is on a latent tendency in all of mm -hmm. us, right. Yeah. Um, yeah. 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 I think just to add, I mean, one thing that I've really appreciated what you've just said here, but also throughout in terms of this kind of ecology of, of harassment and in our institutions um, is, I don't think you use these words, but this is how I'm thinking about it. It's kind of the ethics of care, like the kind of the yeah. feminist queer political ethics of care yeah. in, in this. Yeah. And yeah. I, I feel really like kind of, I mean, like one of the things when I was reading that uh, feminist case against bureaucracy, which I just love that title, but then the feminist critiques of the feminist case against bureaucracy, I, you know, I I found myself thinking about, um, uh, you know, it's like my own interest in things like the administration of sexual harassment cases and the like. It's like from a distance and people who don't really know me, um, it can look very liberal, you know, mm -hmm. and by means like kind of like a kind of a, an investment in kind of governmental feminism or, mm -hmm. you know, like uh, yeah. um, governmentality. I'm trying to remember the phrase that was used by um, um, scholars to name um, um, 
uh, you know, that particular kind of in its most toxic form, like kind of look like law and order feminism, right? Um, mm -hmm. You know, but it's like, there's an, you know, I'm like, um, that um, on the one hand, I understand, you know, but on the other hand, I'm like, it's a, there's a service work, right, that people are take on within our communities to confront and deal with these cases. And it's intensely gendered and it's also really abjected, um, yeah. you know, and so what do we, what are we doing when we turn the, there's a, it's a great essay and it's really interesting, but it's, um, um, an, oh, it's, her name's flown right out of my head. She's actually a Michigan State University faculty member in the law school, I think. And she writes about like the sex bureaucrats, right? Um, and the way that the US legal system kind of um, creates this whole administrative apparatus within our universities. Um, and, um, but what does it mean when we start to heap contempt upon the people yeah. who are managing the offices that are receiving these stories from student staff and faculty of um, harassment and abuse, you know, like I, that's not, um, that's not, not okay with me, frankly. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. Uh, I don't have any answers to it, though. So, <laughs> no. Well, I think you've given us so much to think about. Yeah. Like, just, I'm going to be processing for days, yeah. I think. Um, and I'm wondering if, Suzanne, do you think it might be time to call it? I think so. I think there's yeah. just so yeah. much. Um, yeah. And um, yeah, <laughs> I do share my yeah. email address in the chat. Um, let's see. I think this can be seen by everyone, but I'm not sure. Uh, it's an easy email address. It's just my name, jennifer.doyle at ucr.edu. Um, and um, yeah, that should, yeah. And, and people are welcome to email me thoughts and questions. I am happy to receive observations from folks. Um, yeah. Thank you for uh, making space for this conversation. Oh, thank you. Um, thank you. This is kind of more than I had imagined and in, in like the best kind of way. Um, so I, I really look forward to reading um, your next yeah. the, in the shadow of the shadow. I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah. I have a reading recommendation. Um, okay. So um, uh, the scholar's name is Camille Robsy. And um, she wrote a book called Disalienation. And it's a book about uh, Francois Tosquias, who ran um, a psychiatric hospital in the south of France um, in the earlier, like I want to say it was maybe the, it was um, in the 30s, 40s. Um, and um, uh, Franz Fanon did a, uh, uh, um, a period there, um, mm -hmm. as did Felix Guattari. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, her book has chapters on uh, Tosquias, Fanon, Guattari, and Michel Foucault. Mm. Um, and it's not about harassment, right? But it's about institutions um, and about like, radical psychiatry in France and um, the impact oh. of that movement in the critique of the hospital as an institution mm -hmm. and its impact on these thinkers. And so when I've been leaning into lang the language of ecology, um, ever since I read Felix Guattari's The Three Ecologies, um, which is a, a fantastic essay um, that invites us to sort of think about all kinds of different sort of dynamics around us, especially social dynamics and kind of what he calls a mental ecology. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. And uh, this kind of this, that kind of thinking in his work um, grows um, directly out in relation to um, his participation in like group dynamics and um, the therapeutic context of the uh, psychiatric hospital. Anyway, it's really interesting and provocative to think about that um, that body of work and its insights in relation to the university. Yeah. Oh wow! Thank you. Yeah. So I found I found it on the University of Chicago Chicago Press site. Links in the chat. So for it's those so who are interested, yeah. um, I'm looking forward to checking it out. Um, there's one final a comment. Um, in the Q&A from our colleague, Carol Williams, who says, fantastic and so poignant, really appreciate your incisive commentary and observations. And okay. so I just want to echo that. Um, and before inviting everyone to um, join Suzanne and I in thanking you, Jennifer, um, you know, awkward virtual applause, whatever that might look like, um, I also want to 
uh, announce that we have one uh, more event to go this year in our virtual um, Women Scholars Speaker Series. And this is uh, date and time to be determined. Watch this space. Um, and it's going to be a discussion with Dr. Benita Bunjan about her new book, which is entitled Academic Wellbeing of Racialized Students. Mm -hmm. So yeah, well, we'll send you, we'll send you the info if <laughs> you'll join us if you're able. So thank you again. You've given us so much to think about and yeah, ways to try to, you know, imagine otherwise, survive, etc. So yeah, thank you so much. Thank, thank you, you, Jennifer. Yeah. Bye. <laughs> Take good care. Thank yeah. you everyone for attending. Bye. Yes, thank you. <laughs>